Hello, YouTubers. I had to do a bonus on Marilyn Monroe. I have some more information that I left out. Um, so this will be series of, uh, 12. Um, a bonus. Um, some information that I need to add to the spirit of Marilyn Monroe. Like I said, I contacted her to the Holy Spirit to ask whatever she wanted to say. And then I did the research on the word she's given me, and it came, came down a path of all kinds of people. Dorothy Killigan, I mentioned, was Maryland's secretary, personal secretary North in New York, and she was not a friend of Maryland. She made that clear to the spirit. So I'm just going to read about this woman who I had no idea who it was, but she gave me the word Killigan, and also um, another uh, Guatemo, and um, some sieges, and James Farrell. So, I'm going to finish up. There's still quite a bit left. So, Dorothy Killigan was the daughter of James Killigan, which, by the way, was an elastic that I read earlier. Killigan, who was after Marilyn's money, who was a cooperative of uh, an elite society that was not working for Marilyn. Uh, realtors, lawyers, and her doctors, and her close secretaries and confidants, and so-called friends or not her friends. It's an elite cult that are all out to gain something once they gain access to you and become your advisors, doctors, once you're successful. So this is what happened in Maryland. She was set up. So anyways, Dorothy Killigan, the daughter of James Killigan, is a successful journalist. Remember, media is not your friend in here. It's good to, they want media coverage if you're a celebrity because that's how they get you out there to make millions on you to get you exposed and then once you either go against the grain or dare to speak the truth about anything, you're going to come up missing <laughs> like Marilyn did. Anyways, uh, so she's a successful journalist, was born in Chicago, which is a really big city for a lot of the elite. They do a lot of wheeling and dealing. Chicago is one of the uh, places among Hollywood where Maryland seems to direct me to. So, uh, she was uh, born on July 3rd, 1913. Killigan studies at the New Rochelle College before beginning work as a journalist at the New York Journal Newspaper mm -hmm, by William Randolph Hearst. She's a very elite socialite. Killigan became a crime reporter and covered several important cases of her newspaper. It included trials like Anna Antonio, 1934, Eva Koo, 1935, and Richard Bruno Hauptman in 1935. In September of 36, Killigan took part of a race around the world against fellow newsman Bud Edkins. Ekins of the New York World Telegram and Leo Kirian of the New York Times. The trip took Killigan 24 days and she came second to Ekins 21 days. Afterwards, she published her book, Roll Around the World. She also appeared in the film, Skinny Take All, in 1936. The following year, she wrote the film script, Fly Away Baby. Killigan abandoned her film career and returned, so you know she's connected to some elite people in Hollywood. Well, they're all connected. So she started off knowing some groups through Hollywood as well as media, which are the two most corrupt places that, that you, um, they have a lot of power, let's just say that. Okay, the trip to, took Killigan 24 days. Okay, where was it? Killigan abandoned her film career and worked for a New York Journal in November 1937. She was given her own column, Hollywood Scene. Well, who gave her that? Who won the newspaper? <laughs> okay, let's go. Who owns the newspapers? Think about it, folks. The media. Okay. <clears throat> she owned her own column, Hollywood Scene. The following year, she began writing a new column, The Voice of Broadway. Okay, now you see the connection with her in Maryland. Suddenly, she's her personal secretary. Maryland. You gotta be careful of people like this. And who who gets her to work? Who does she work for? You understand what I mean? 
1940 kill again. They kill again and again and again. The 1940 Killigan married Richard Colmar. Over the next couple of years, the couple had three children, Jill, Richard, and Carrie. Now, Carrie and Jill, I circled on this report, they were both names Marilyn gave me, so it was the fact letting me know that this was the person she wanted me to, to know. In April 45, the couple began a daily morning radio show, Breakfast and Dorothy and, and Dick. And the program went out live, Monday and Saturday, 8 to 8.55, and Sunday, 11 to 12. Over the years, the program was gradually commercialized. Companies, companies, what companies? Hmm. Companies paid to have their products mentioned over breakfast, and theater producers arranged to have their plays and musicals discussed over breakfast. Films and books are also promoted by the host. Strasbourg. Hmm. A dance and film, acting. Theater, drama, that's also an elite club. In 1941, the column was appearing in 24 other newspapers. Killigan was now one of the most important classic columnists in America. 1950, it was estimated that she had 20 million readers. Killigan achieved this position by developing a very good strategy for gaining secret information. Gaining secret information about famous people. Hello. And she was Marilyn's closest ally, secret secretary? Come on. Killigan achieved this position by developing a very good strategy and gathering secret information about famous people. Killigan was swamped Killigan, I'm sorry, was swamped with requests by press agents to plug the activities of their clients. Killigan always refused their request. Instead she offered a deal. Bring me three experimental stories concerning other stars, and I will include a good piece about your client. And these stars were usually rivals of their clients, and they were too willing to do so. Killigan also became a television star and was at 15 years a regular panelist on the television program What's My Line, 1950 to 65. As well as her gossip column, Killigan continued to report her famous criminal case. Her investigative work secured a new trial of Sam Shepard, a case in later basis in the popular television series, The Fugitive. Killigan sometimes wrote articles about political issues. According to several of her close friends, Killigan received information from the Central Intelligence Office, CIA. Marilyn mentioned the CIA. She was a culvert of the CIA. A study of her writing suggests that she was an important CIA media asset. Killigan was extremely well informed of the situation in Cuba, which Marilyn was aware of, with the UFO, CIA, media. Okay. Marilyn, personal secretary? Look at her background, folks. This is terrible. Killigan sometimes wrote articles about political issues. Okay, CIA agency. A study of her writing suggests she was an important CIA media asset. Killigan was extremely well informed of the situation in Cuba. 1959 to 60, Killigan included a large number of anti Castro stories in her columns. Some of this information came from Cuban exiles based in Miami. Sometimes Killigan included highly subversive materials in her column. For example, on the 15th of July, 59, Killigan became the first journalist to suggest that the CIA and the Mafia were working together in order to assassinate Fido Castro. I mean, assassinate Kennedy and assassinate Monroe and assassinate Robert Kennedy, amongst many others. I'm not saying she did it, but she's part of the book. In September 59, Killigan reported of the visit of Natika Schwarzenegger, Journal American. Killigan created a storm when she attacked the dress sense of his wife, Nina Korshaf, the grisliness of her attire, amounts almost to a demonstration of piety. It would be difficult to find clothes comparable to hers in the waiting room of New York Employment Agency for Domestic Health in the decadent capitalist republic. And um, the applicants for jobs and laundress, chambermaids, and cooks usually are far more a load mode than Russia's first lady. So many people complained about the article that Killigan feared she would have to resign. Hmm. Poor baby. Okay, and 
So, yeah, she was not, you know, supposed to get anything. She deceived her. Uh, she had access to many elite people that were keeping an eye on Mara. Okay, and with Tomino, I'm sorry about the phone. With Tomino, I came up with Marilyn. This is the word she gave me. Still today, U.S. Black certification for strike on Syria. Michael Ratner, the president and matrix of Central and Constitutional Rights of New York and chair of European Central Constitution and Human Rights of Berlin, me, he is currently a legal advisor to Wilkius and Julian Assange. He and CCR brought the first case challenging the Guantanamo detention and continued their efforts to close Guantanamo. He taught at Yale Law School and Columbia Law School. Da, 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 da. Who killed Chi? The CIA got away with murder. Mr. Radner speaks of his own behalf and not for any organization in which he is affiliated. So basically, it just came up. Um, it's an article about Guantanamo, and the funny thing is, it is connected. It's an interesting article, article, because in the corner of this page, it's written by, I can't see it, my sister, Marilyn Monroe, Get Down and Dirty World News. So, it's just telling about today's news, but there's Marilyn Monroe, my sister. So it's an article about Guatemala, and Marilyn gave me that word, and this case came up. Uh, welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Joshua Noor in Baltimore, and welcome to this latest edition of Ratner Report. Now joined by Michael Ratner. Michael, so we have been talking about it. Part one of our two-part interview, we're talking about the legality of a possible USA strike on Syria, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Russia's role. Obama and Putin have been meeting in Russia at the G20 summit, and Putin had said, show me the evidence Obama has thus far refused to do so, and Russia had also come out with a 100-page report, which they say proved that it was the Syrian rebels who carried out the Syrian gas attacks on Apollo in March, and what's your response to the latest developments? Michael Ratner, President Emeritus Center for Constitutional Rights. You know, my first response, and I just want to say, it's clearly, again, two things. One, it is illegal to make the war without going to the U.N., illegal for the U.S. to do that. And secondly, I consider the chemical weapons issue to be a pretext. I think the U.S. has other motives for wanting to, quote, degrade Assad and support the rebels. So I consider it to pretext, and that everybody in the world is looking for the evidence of that. Evidence. It reminds me of, you know, obviously it reminds me of the Iraq War, and we've talked about that before. So let's focus right on this right now. The Obama administration has claimed that it has proved that the Assad government is using chemical weapons, but it really has failed to convince very many people, with the exception of its own close friends, some members of Congress, some people in its own government, perhaps the new poodle of the United States France. The British actually, the British Parliament actually was not convinced by the evidence that Assad was pursuing chemical weapons and said we want more conclusive evidence on this. So let's start from there. And they haven't yet. One proved that their chemical weapons haven't been used, and secondly, they certainly haven't proved that the Assad government was involved in using them in the direct them or that directed their use. That's not saying they weren't. I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly saying we won't. It hasn't been proven it yet, particularly after experience with the Iraq War. You're going to have to see very hard evidence of this that this occurred. Even as I said, I don't think that justifies going to war and bombing Syria. I think it justifies perhaps, you know, taking someone to an international criminal court. It doesn't justify us start, starting to bomb a country. But then let's put that in context of Russia and the Russian assertion or claim, which they had done incredible amount of study in a 100-page report on March 19th, the year discovered outside the Apollo Theorem, that the rebels and the rebels will have chemical weapons which killed perhaps not as many people as were liked in this more recent attack in August, but killed 
you know, a couple of dozen people with chemical weapons and injured a lot more. The Russians admitted that the report of the UN, the UN actually that taken it seriously. Chemical weapons inspectors have been in serious, serious, determining whether on March 19th attacks were chemical weapons and who caused it. And this continues on and on and on. But that was something Marilyn wanted me to read, and it has her name. So maybe to this day, Marilyn's so concerned about the fraudulent crap going on behind the scenes and who's doing what. And I'm going to finish this. Um, and the last two words, which siege was for Marilyn, S-E-I-G-E. -E. Miami, the siege of Chicago, 68, journalism. Mailer biography fiction book, Miami and the Siege of Chicago, The History of the Republican Democrat Conventions in 1968, New York Library. So that came up under her name, as well as Zelos. Found Jeannie Zelos was an artwork from Marilyn Monroe, and if you can't handle me at my worst, then you sure to hell don't deserve me at my best. Marilyn Monroe, Jeannie Zelos. That was one of Marilyn's favorite quotes from uh, Janie Zelos. She wanted to say, in 1986, it said that in Marilyn's biography, she did not approve of DiMaggio having an interview with Don Henderson, Philly's radio network. And that's it. That's all I got from Marilyn on the truth. And that was the bonus video today, December 17th, 2013. And I conclude with the spirit of Marilyn Monroe seeking the truth from her own words, my final video. And like I said, I said on my last video, my next report will be Anna Nicole. And as you can see, I have plenty of notes that I've gotten to the spirit that I have to do some research on. And we'll find out some tips through Marilyn and her son, David. Have a good day.